Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ICTS string seminar. So today we have Josh Pennington from UC Berkeley, who will be talking to us about type two for Neumann algebra and quantum gravity. So over to you, Josh. Okay, great. So uh, thanks very much for inviting me to talk. Um, I'd like to apologize. I was planning to, to talk about my most recent paper with, with Ed Whitten, came out in January. Um, but the slides I was going to give have, have spontaneously deleted themselves from my laptop and I, I couldn't get hold of a previous safe version of them. Um, so instead, I'm going to give a slightly high level overview talk of, of a few papers written last year, all with Witten, uh, two of them with Venture and Tecron, and, and one with uh, Roberto Longo, um, which includes very briefly the end, the most recent paper, but it's more going to be uh, about some of the earlier stuff. Um, so the heart of all of these papers is the idea of generalized entropy and, and trying to understand what it is better. Um, so, you know, we've known for 50 years now that the horizon area of, the black, of a black hole is in some way related to entropy via this formula of uh, S equals A over G um, due to Beckenstein and Hawking. Um, but of course, G here presumably is, is some bare Newton's constant, uh, but that needs to be renormalized. Uh, and so as written, this quantity doesn't make any sense of its own. It's not UV finite. And the way we renormalize it is to add uh, uh, entanglement entropy of matter fields outside the horizon. And this gives a UV finite, or believe, strongly believed to be UV finite quantity called generalized entropy, which is A over 4G plus this sort of bulk matter entropy of, of, of entropy outside the black hole horizon. So there's some standard law that says that this generalized entropy is in some way equal to the entropy of the black hole and everything outside. Okay, so, so this is the everything outside, and then this is the, the entropy of the black hole. Neither of them are well defined on their own, but together they give some finite thing, which is counting the entropy of all that stuff. So what does this actually mean though? Well, there's various contexts where we can we can make it pretty precise. Um, so, for example, in uh, a bit smaller. Uh, so, for example, in, in in for extremal black holes in string theory, then we have literal integer counts of states uh, that can be computed on the string theory side. It can be computed using gravity path integral, which gives a and four g plus plus corrections. Uh, so we have a very precise sense, which is just counting the logarithm of the number of states. Um, in ADS-CFT, we have this notion of the, C the QES prescription, the Ryutaki Nagi formula, that says the entanglement entropy of some, some boundary region is given by the generalized entropy of a, a dual bulk region. Um, and we can derive that, you know, but we, we can only derive it using so-called Euclidean gravity path integrals, which are a sort of black magic from the gravity point of view, at least in a, a, a canonically quantized gravity point of view. And in other settings, it's even less clear what's going on. Um, so for example, um, in, in cosmological horizons, uh, say to city space, then we have a horizon that has a generalized entropy that, that sort of behaves as an entropy in a similar way, but its meaning is, is even less understood than, than say Schwarzschild black holes in flat space, where we already don't have a, a very precise, precise statement of what this is gonna be the entropy of, what's it really counting. So, um, you know, the goal of this talk is to try and make this a bit more concrete in a very, very controlled setting, uh, really just sort of semi-classical, canonically quantized quantum gravity without any, without any Euclidean path integrals or anything, anything wacky or crazy like that, where we, we sort of follow rules without really knowing why they make sense. Um, and the way we're going to try and try and connect this generalized entropy entropy is, is that actually, if you go back to the original uh, arguments by Hawking in, in the 1970s, then uh, there's a connection between generalized entropy and entropy that, that doesn't rely on Euclidean path integrals or anything like that at all. Um, so what do, we, what do we know about generalized entropy just in the context of, of Lorentzian semi-classical gravity? Well, we have Hawking's original argument where he derived that formula, namely that we can derive the Hawking temperature of a black hole, not the entropy, but the temperature, just using using Lorentzian semi-classical physics. 
Okay, so you just do Q of T in, in a, a fixed curve space time, you see gravity is frozen out, and you see some radiation comes out at some temperature. Then we can plug that in. Uh, we have energy as a function of temperature. We can solve uh, for D equals T dS, and we find after a little bit of work that dS equals dA over 4G. Okay, and then finally, if we assume that for sufficiently a small black hole has some, some finite S, uh, fixed finite s, there's not the infinite number of remnant states that look like a small black hole, uh, then we conclude that we can sort of integrate this up from, from black hole to rising area zero up to a subleading f correction, then, then for large black holes, we just have f equals a over three. Okay, so then we declare victory. We've, we've derived the vacancy and hockey entropy on the s equals a over four. So why do we not say that this is it? This is done. This is deriving the, the vagantine hockey entropy in the most general setting you could possibly imagine, just, just literally Lorentzian some classical gravity. We don't need anything more than that. Well, it's because all of this is about deriving an entropy in the sense of classical thermodynamics, not in the sense of statistical mechanics, right? There's no counting over states here. There's no row log row. There's nothing like that whatsoever. All there is, is is D equals TDS, which people have been using for you know, the better part of a century before anyone connected it to, to entropy in the modern statistical sense. Okay, so to the extent that we believe, sorry, to the extent that we believe this S is actually a statistical entropy just based on Hawking's argument without appealing to string theory or, or Gibbons Hawking, Euclidean path integrals, whatever. Um, fancier stuff like that that's, that's harder to interpret or, or relies on stronger assumptions. It's just that we learn lessons from classical thermodynamics. And one of those lessons is that if you have something obeying these equations, it's probably coming from, from some statistical mechanics. But we can't actually see that statistical mechanics going up. OK, so the goal of today's talk is going to be to explain uh, how we can find a set of degrees of freedom in Lorentzian semi-classical gravity in the strict G goes to zero limit, same setting really that Hawking was considering with a couple of very minor twists, um, that actually have a statistical entropy that's equal to the generalized entropy of black hole. So in contrast to Hawking's thing, we're not going to be able to just get DS as a um, classical thermodynamic quantity. We're going to be able to get it as a statistical quantity. I want to be clear. Uh, what we're not doing here, so we, we're really going to be in the strict limit of taking the, the gravitational coupling G to zero. Um, so we're not going to be able to sort of see individual microstates in this formalism because there's actually going to be infinitely many microstates. A over 4G is going to become, become infinite in this limit. But what we are going to see is what's called the type 2 von Neumann algebra. This is just some fancy, fancy mathematical formalism that lets us describe infinite entanglement entropies, infinite statistical entropies in a rigorous manner, okay? So we're going to have infinitely number of states, infinite number of states getting involved, um, but we're going to be able to compare uh, the number of states, the entropies of different states, and we're going to get finite differences between them, and we're going to be able to match those with the vacancy Hawking formula. So then I'm going to hopefully explain briefly how there's a, the, to interpret this, this algebra from a, a boundary CFT point of view, in terms of the, the large n limits of CFT correlation functions and, and constructing a large n theory out of that data. I'm going to talk about how those ideas extend to semi classical to sitter space um, and how you, you can interpret generalized entropy in that context. It's going to be an interesting twist there related to the fact that sitter space has a maximum entropy, whereas black holes do not. And then finally, uh, this is the thing I wanted to spend the entire talk on uh, before the technical issue. We're going to move slightly away from the strict semi-classical limit of Q goes to zero, and we're going to consider JT gravity. We're going to consider JT gravity in the so-called disk approximation, so not including wormholes or topology change or anything like that, um, but at, at finite temperature. So this corresponds to, to studying near extremal black holes, where the extremal entropy of that black hole is infinite, but the entropy above extremality is finite. In particular, it's less semi-classical because the geometry is able to fluctuate more. You're able to have things like, like long wormhole states with very different wormhole geometries and so on. Um, and we're still going to see the same 
same sort of structure show up, the same, same type two von Neumann algorithm is going to explain generalized entropy, including, including quantum corrections from the so-called Schwarzian mode uh, in the same sort of formula. Hi, hi Jeff, I have a question. Yep. So if you go back to your previous slide, uh, this is just a question at an yep. overview level. So uh, yep. if you, you know, there is much older observations by Saskind and Toft and others that you know, if you compute the, the entanglement entropy, uh, you could make sense of it by renormalizing the Newton's constant. So how, yep. how are the results on the first few bullet points of your slide going to be related to, to these older observations? I mean, are there a way of reframing the older observations in the language of von Neumann algebras or? Or no, it, I uh, think they're totally new observations that they, those guys were not seeing at all. Um, so basically what, okay, what, what those observations were saying is, is A, that generalized entropy seems to be a UV finite quantity. Okay, so that there aren't UV divergences. We'll see, we'll see the same thing there that, that um, yeah, sort of UV issues go away. Um, and secondly, that the entanglement entropy uh, you know, the, the entanglement entropy of the low energy field scales scales roughly with, with area. Um, what that does not let you see is that roughly the, the sort of number of microstates uh, is proportional to e to the a over 4g. Okay. Um, we have to we have to be slightly precise about what we mean by by number of microstates being proportional to that, because the number of microstates is infinite. But there's a very precise sense in which this in this type 2 von Neumann algebra. You have a number of states for each horizon area. This is for the black hole, not just for the, the low energy quantum fields outside it, um, that grows with the area of the, the black hole as e to the a over 4g. Um, so that's something you, I don't think you can, could see at all in these older ideas. That, that's just not present there in, in any shape or form. I see. OK, thanks. Okay. OK, so so we just want to start with a kind of high level mathematical overview of what these von Neumann algebras actually are, because you know, they're going to be the heart of this, this whole talk. Um, I'll try to be quick. I'm not going to be super precise, uh, so you know, don't be too aggressive in calling out anything slightly floppy, I say. But roughly, it's it's um, bounded operators acting on a Hilbert space. Bounded operators, just because in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, operators need to be bounded to be well-defined for all states in the Hilbert space. It makes them a lot simpler to talk about. Um, we want this deck to form an algebra. So if you add things in, in, in A, then they should stay in A, you should be able to multiply them, uh, and it should also contain the identity. Um, this algebra should be closed under Hermitian conjugation. And finally, there's this, this slightly weirder condition that it should be closed with respect to the so-called strong operator topology. What this means is that if I take some limit of a sequence of operators that are all in the algebra, then the limit should also be in the algebra, okay? But with operators on infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, you have to be slightly careful by what you mean by a limit. Um, and specifically, we mean this limit that a the sequence a n converges to a if for any fixed state psi, then a n of psi converges to a of psi, okay? So this is slightly different from, say, the norm topology where the norm of a of n minus a have to, has to tend to zero. Um, don't worry too much about the, the detailed subtleties at that point, but it turns out this is really the sort of natural, uh, the natural topology, the, the natural requirement from a physics point of view, because it captures uh, the sense in which a n approximates a from the purpose it, purpose of any any uh, reasonable set of measurements that you could do. Okay, so there's an extra condition you can impose on on this algebra a which is the, to require that its center, so the things in A that commute with everything in A, consists only of multiples of the identity. If that's true, we say that A is a so-called von Neumann factor. Turns out von Neumann factors are a very nice thing to study, because actually any von Neumann algebra can be written as basically a direct sum, of, or an infinite direct sum for the direct integral uh, of von Neumann factors. Okay, so there's sort of building blocks that you build all other von Neumann algebras out of. It turns out there's various types of von Neumann factors. Uh, the first one's what's called type one factors. Uh, so this is the kind of obvious example uh, of just the algebra of all bounded operators acting on some Hilbert space. This Hilbert space could be H itself, the H that the, the algebra is defined to act on, or it could be some subsystem of H. So we have H is HA tends to HB, 
then we could consider all the algebras that are acting on just this subsystem H A. That's again a, a type one factor. Okay, so it's sort of clear that this is this is you know von Neumann algebra is nicely closed in all the ways you want. It's also a factor because um, it's it trivially the the center of consistent size only of C numbers. These factors are labeled uh, by the dimension of the Hilbert space H A that they act on. In fact, up to isomorphism, there's a, a unique so-called type 1D factor for each such identity, either, either finite dimension, so each such dimension, either a finite dimension or that there's a single infinite dimension one, so a countably infinite dimension of H. In finite dimensions, these are actually the only von Neumann factors you can possibly have. There's, there's nothing else that can exist. Um, but in infinite dimensions, then, then there's more subtle possibilities. Morally, these more subtle uh, types of von Neumann factors should still be thought of as, as the algebra of all operators on some subset of the degrees of freedom. But those degrees of freedom no longer really form a Hilbert sub subspace, Hilbert subsystem, tensor product subsystem. And that's because they can be infinitely entangled with the rest of the Hilbert space. I'm going to see a very concrete example of this in the next slide. And that's the so-called uh, hyperfinite type 2 1 von Neumann factor. So let's consider a Hilbert space, H, that's going to consist of infinitely many pairs of qubits. Okay, so each of these circles represents a qubit. We have the first pair, second pair, so on, and they're arranged in this infinite dimensional way. So the naive Hilbert space you would make that way would have uncountably infinite dimension. It would be what's called a non-separable uh, Hilbert space. And those are pretty nasty to deal with from a physics point of view. We're normally interested in, in separable Hilbert spaces that have countably infinite dimension. So we're instead going to consider a Hilbert space where all but finitely many pairs of qubits are in a particular maximally entangled state psi, so some Bell state, say, kept half 0, 0, plus 1, 1, for example. So here I've written, see, these first three pairs, that's six qubits that can be in any state phi we want, um, but then all the rest of the pairs are just, just in products of, of these Bell states. Okay, but it doesn't have to be three. It could be some arbitrarily large large number of, of finite number of, of qubits that are in some weird state, as long as the remaining infinite number of qubits are all maximum. I should say technically what I just described is a vector space, but not a Hilbert space. Uh, we need to include limits of sequences of these states that converge with the inner product norm, uh, then we'll get a Hilbert space. Okay, so it's natural to consider the algebra of operators acting on finitely many qubits in just the top row uh, of this Hilbert space. Okay, that's an algebra, I can take products of it. Um, and, and they still just act on the top row and they still just act on finitely many qubits. Um, technically, it's not as I just defined it, it's not a von Neumann algebra um, because we need to take its completion again with respect to topology. We need to include limits of, of sequences of these operators. But morally, the thing we end up with after we do so is still just the algebra of operators acting on finitely many qubits in the top row. Okay, trivially, pretty trivially a von Neumann factor because. Any non-trivial operator acting on, on finitely many qubits in the top row, I can find something that doesn't commute with that. But the Hilbert space H is very definitely not a tensor product of a Hilbert space of the top row with a Hilbert space bottom row of qubits, um, right? Because every state in this Hilbert space has infinite entanglement between the two rows. Every state in the Hilbert space has infinitely many maximum entangled states. So there's no product states that are product of something in the top row with something in the bottom. So this is a new uh, type of, of von Neumann algebra that's called, called a, a type 2, 1 factor. So there's an interesting feature of this algebra. So there's a particular state, which I'm going to call capital phi, just consists of a product of maximally entangled state psi on every pair of qubits, OK? So every state has this, this product of size on, on all but finitely many. This is as a product of phi's size on all but zero of that. Every single state pair of, pair of qubits is just in this maximum entangled state. 
we can define something that we call a trace of an operator in the algebra. So some operator just acting on the top rows. Uh, just the expectation of that operator in this particular special uh, product and maximally entangled thing. I want to be clear that this is not the trace of the operator A on the Hilbert space H. That would actually be infinite for any A just acting on the top row of qubits, um, roughly because you've got infinitely many qubits in the bottom row and it acts as the identity on them. Um, but it's sort of morally similar to a trace, or it, it algebraically feels like a trace, because if we take the product of A and B, then the trace of AB is equal to the trace of BA for any A and B in the algebra. To see this, just note that if A only acts on the first n top row qubits, then the trace of, of A defined in this way is equal to just the normal trace of A on those n qubits divided by 2 to the n. Trivially, this normal trace satisfies the property that trace AB equals trace BA. Um, and so any A and B that only act on finitely many qubits, then we have this property that this little trace of AB equals little trace of BA. Okay, we can always find some n that, that's large enough that they both only act on the first n, and then we have this equivalent. Morally, this, this trace of A should be thought of as the trace on all infinitely many qubits in the top row divided by 2 to the infinite. So that you, doesn't you, make your A uh, was said to be 0 on the other qubits, right? Not, not to be identity on the other qubits, like this trace you defined for the first n qubits? Uh, sorry. So... This operator A acts as the identity on all the remaining qubits. What I'm saying is that the trace defined in this way is this expectation value of this maximally entangled state is yes. equal to just forgetting about all the operator, all the qubits except for the first n ones that A acts on, and then considering just the trace of A just on those first n qubits, and oh, then I dividing see. by two to the n. I see. Okay, okay. Thank you. The density matrix on those first n qubits is, is maximally mixed. It's the identity of the two. Okay, okay, thank you. Right. Okay. So, turns out on a von Neumann factor, then a trace, if it exists, is always unique up to, up to at most rescaling. So, we could, we could multiply this trace by, by any constant. It would still satisfy this property of trace of AB equals trace of BA. Um, to modulate that strategy, then, then the trace when it exists has to be unique. However, unlike the trace we had, the, the usual trace on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, this trace is finite for any bounded operator. In particular, it's finite for the identity. According to this definition of trace, the trace of the identity is just equal to one, right? It's just the expectation of one in some normalized state, so it's one. An uh, expectation of any bounded operator in a normalized state is bounded by the norm of that operator, so it should be finite. Um, so this trace is quite weird. It, it behaves quite differently um, to the, the uh, traces we used to on Hilbert spaces, but it algebraically seems to behave similarly. Because any, any algebra that has a finite, that's infinite dimensional, but has a finite trace like this, is known as a type 2, 1 von Neumann factor. The type 2 means that it has a trace, but it's not a type 1 factor, so it's not just the algebra of operators on a subsystem. The 1 part is about the fact that the trace of the identity is finite. So the trace of the identity on a finite Hilbert space is equal to d. So we call them type 1 d factors before if they were on d-dimensional Hilbert space. Um, so in this case, we've normalized it so the trace is equal to 1, so we call it a type 2, 1 factor. Simple enough. The interesting thing about the tra having a trace is that we can use it to find density matrices for any state. Density matrix associated to an algebra, uh, the algebra A. The way we do that is just in exactly the usual way we define density matrices. We define them as the unique positive, uh, positive operator rho phi, uh, such that trace of rho phi times A is equal to the expectation of A in our state phi. Okay, simple enough. That now we're using this new renormalized notion. We have a density matrix, we can also define ent entropies for that density matrix. Just by the usual formula, that the entropy of, of rho is equal to the trace of minus rho log, log rho. Again, the only thing that's changed is that the trace and this formula are both defined using this, this renormalized, renormalized notion. Trace. 
So let's consider, for example, this maximally entangled state, psi. By definition, the trace of any operator A is just equal to the expectation from the state psi of A. So that means we must have the density matrix of the state psi on this algebra is just equal to the identity, right? If you compare this formula to the one up here, then they match if we stick that row phi is equal to one. Plug that into the formula for the entropy, and we get the entropy of this maximally entangled state is equal to zero. If you're used to ordinary entropies on, on type one factors, on, on Hilbert space subsystems, um, then that's probably going to sound a bit strange. How can a maximally entangled state be equal to zero? Well, it turns out that with this definition of entropy, then any state has entropy less than or equal to zero. Um, and so this is actually ma a maximum entropy state. It's just any other state has, has smaller entropy. So what on earth does, does negative entropy mean? Well, morally, this trace is like the, the usual trace in the Hilbert space divided by infinity. Okay, so this row should be thought of as the real density matrix times infinity. In this formula, S of row equals minus trace row log row, we have a one over infinity in the trace, which cancels out the multiplied by infinity in the row. So that, that sort of cancels out. But then this log row, looks like log of the real density matrix, the sort of true density matrix minus this log of infinity. So that means the, the entropy we're getting in this formula has an infinite universal divergence subtracted. It's a renormalized entanglement entropy that subtracts away the, the infinite part of the entanglement. Just leaving us with some finite entropy deficit relative to the maximum entangled, maximally entangled. Okay, so that's why entropies are all less than equal to zero. In type two one factors, we can also make another type of von Neumann factor just by taking the tensor product of a type two one factor with a type one infinity factor. So this is not an algebra of bounded operators in a Hilbert space subsystem, so it's, it's not type one. It has a trace. Its trace is just defined by taking the tensor product of the trace on the type two one factor with the trace on the type one infinity factor. Okay, that gives us gives us a new trace. However, the trace of the identity in this algebra is equal to infinity. It's equal to infinity because the trace of the identity on the type one infinity factor is equal to infinity, right? It's an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So when we multiply that with the type two one factor trace, we still get infinity. So the algebra can't be a type two one factor because that was defined by all bounded operators having a, a finite trace. Instead, it's known as a type two infinity. You can define density matrices and entropies for exact for type two infinity factors, just like we did for type one factors. However, there's a difference, which is that there's no uh, maximally mixed state anymore, no maximally entangled state. That's because entropy is unbounded for above. The trace of the identity matrix is infinity, uh, so you can't make a, a sort of correctly normalized uh, maximum entropy state, just like you can't on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. In fact, before I go on, let me also just say um, that because the trace of the identity on type two infinity factor is infinity, then there's no natural way to normalize this trace, unlike for a type two one factor where we naturally normalized it so the trace of identity is equal to one. That means the entropies are naturally only defined up to a sort of arbitrary additive. That's going to show up again later in the talk, but uh, it's worth mentioning. Okay, so just for completion, just talk about the last type of von Neumann algebra that can show up, that's called a type three factor. So what happens if we replace this maximally entangled state psi on the pair of qubits by some other state, psi prime? It's entangled, but isn't maximally entangled. Turns out essentially everything goes through, we still get a nice von Neumann factor at the end of the end of the construction. However, the state that's like a product of a load of copies of psi prime is not tracial. Okay, it doesn't have trace AB equals trace BA, because the state psi prime is not maximally entangled. So it doesn't have a maximally mixed reduced density matrix. And of course, we can't define a straight state as an infinite product of a maximally entangled state psi because that's not in the Hilbert space. The Hilbert space has to have all but finitely many of them pairs in the state psi prime. So in fact, it turns out that no trace can be defined on such an algebra. There's just no way to, to construct a, a sensible definition. And roughly the problem is that the two rows of qubits here are no longer just infinitely entangled, 
they also have infinite fluctuations in the amount of their entanglement. So it's like the difference between a, a, in the canonical ensemble, you have infinite fluctuations in, in energy and the, the thermodynamic limit, they diverge as, as square root of the, of, of, of the system size. Um, whereas for a sort of micro canonical ensemble or some, some maximally mixed ensemble, um, then all the probabilities are the same. The probability of any individual state the same, the entropy, entropy is constant. Okay, so algebras that don't have a trace like this are known as type three factors. And there's a particularly important example of them in physics, which is the algebra associated to any subregion in QFT. So what happens there is you have an infinite number of, of Winler modes that have to be thermally entangled across the edge of the subsystem, subregion, between the subregion and the stuff outside it. And those give exactly the same effect as these non maximally entangled states I prime. They give this, this type three thermal effect. Okay, great. So that was sort of fast, but also sort of long. That was your lightning review of uh, von Neumann algebras. Hopefully, you guys are now all experts that are you zoned out and now you can zone back in to, to listen to some actual physics. Let's talk about some black holes. Okay, so we're going to try and understand black holes and canonically quantized gravity in the limit where we've taken Newton's constant to zero. So essentially- hey, just, sorry, sorry, can I ask a, can I ask a sli perhaps a sli slightly annoying question about uh, the, the previous discussion before you go into physics? Uh, so the, the, the point is, I mean, you know, uh, usually in quantum field theory, we do want to define the entanglement entropy often for a finite region. Of course, as you said, the trace is not defined. And so this is UV divergent. And usually what yeah. we would say is, you know, we, we, we introduce some lattice regularization and then it's a type one algebra and then we just take the trace in that. Uh, why, why is that a bad thing to do? I mean, why is, why is, it, why, why is that? Uh, uh, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to do. Um, I think there can be interesting physics you lose when you take a lattice regularization. You lose, for example, like strict causality, you lose, uh, you lose, you lose, yeah, you, you lose like, um, uh, and, and that can give you a lot of interesting things. So like things like the proof of the QNIC and stuff rely like, crucially on working with, with continuum uh, algebras. So I think it's, it's very useful to, to study the continuum theory instead. But yeah, totally, totally. Sometimes you can just regularize the, uh, the QFT and, and it gives sensible answers. And, and we do that all the time and it's great. Um, just sometimes there's better things to do. Uh, in particular, if you did that, for, for a black hole, if you regularize the QFT at the, you know, put some cutoff at the horizon, um, then you wouldn't get all the stuff I'm gonna, gonna describe to you now. Okay. Like okay. The whole structure I'm gonna give you relies crucially on, on working with the continuum. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, great. So essentially, we've just reduced quantum gravity to a quantum field theory and a fixed background. So you have, Graviton fluctuations, but they're just some spree spin two field. You know, that's not, you know, that's just a basically just a QFT. Uh, it's a slightly weird one, but it's basically just a QFT. Um, but it turns out for a two-sided black hole, there's one extra mode, one extra quantum gravity mode uh, that you can keep even in the G goes to zero limit uh, that will play a crucial role. And that is what's called the time shift between the left and right boundary. This is a physical degree of freedom um, that roughly describes uh, if I start at t equals zero over on the right boundary, and then I head straight across through the wormhole to the left boundary without doing any kink at the, the, uh, at the bifurcation surface, then what time do I end up on the left boundary, right? The times of the left and right boundaries are physical, uh, the physical degrees of freedom, um, and, and the difference between them can't be can't be moved by a change of coordinates. It's a physical degree of freedom, non-local degree of freedom in the problem. In fact, it's, it's a physical degree of freedom that's conjugate to uh, either or both the, the left and the right ADM masses of the black hole. So if I act with the, the left or right ADM mass, um, then that evolves the right boundary forwards. It shifts the state at, at right boundary time t equals zero to right boundary time uh, t equals epsilon or whatever, uh, and that shifts the time shift, generates translations of the time shift between the two boundaries because we've changed the right time but not the left, or vice versa if we act with the left. Okay, so the difference 
between the two ADM methods, for example, on the, on the other hand, where we evolve the right boundary forwards in time, but then evolve the left boundary backwards in time, uh, does not change the time shift. It keep, lays, keeps the time shift fixed. All it does is act as a boost of the state of the quantum fields in the space time. Okay, because we've shifted uh, the right boundary up, the left boundary down, and then we can boost the whole thing, including the boundaries. That's just a gauge transformation. And now we're back where we started. The boundary points are in the same place. They were boundaries in the same place they were, except the quantum fields now. Okay. okay. So the whole Hilbert space can be thought of as a tensor product of the Q of T Hilbert space with this one extra L2 of R degree of freedom uh, that describes the time shift between the two sides. And how we think about that, whether we think of it as fluct describing fluctuations in the time of the left boundary or time of the right boundary, is sort of a gauge choice. Um, but we can always fix, and it's convenient to, to fix the time of the right boundary to be t equals zero at t equals zero in the middle here. Um, and then this time shift mode describes fluctuations in where t equals zero on the left boundary is. Okay, so it's described by some wave function, some some uh, wave function over over time. Okay, so now we have a Hilbert space. We can describe an algebra acting on that Hilbert space, generated essentially by the two obvious things. The first is just Q of T observables in the right exterior. Okay, it's actually a general theorem called the time length tube theorem that is enough to just consider Q of T observables actually at infinity. But an observer outside the right black hole should be able to measure any quantum field theory observer outside the black hole observable outside the black hole. And then there's one more thing we have, which is that we also have this right ADM map. Okay, we have the energy of the black hole, and that can be thought of as acting on both the, the Q of T observables and uh, the L2 of R, this time shift mode. Okay, so there's a couple of subtleties here that it's worth, worth addressing. Um, the first is that in quantum gravity, uh, local bulk observables need to be dressed. Um, in order to be diffeomorphism invariant. Because we're all just working around some fixed fixed background, um, then uh, the dressing is pretty trivial. Essentially, it means that rather than defining these things to act at a certain bulk time, we should act describe them as acting in a certain right boundary time. OK? But we already chose a gauge where the right boundary time is sort of already equal to the bulk time. Um, so that's that's trivially true. So just the ordinary Q of T observable, just acting on H Q of T, are, are already naturally dressed to the right boundary. If we wanted to dress them to the left boundary, we'd have to conjugate them with some some time value. There's another subtlety, which is that the right ADM mass actually diverges as we take G to zero if we keep the radius of the the black hole fixed, so that we keep the geometry fixed. Okay. So what we instead want to do is to find a finite renormalized ADM mass where we take the actual ADM mass and then subtract E0, where E0 is the, the mass of the black hole background. OK, so this thing is describing fluctuations in the ADM mass, but we've subtracted an, an infinite constant. In Sorry, uh, I, I want to say something here. But I think we had lost you for some time. So could, oh, you, okay. could you go a bit backwards? I'm sorry about this, but. Uh... Just uh, how, how long have I been lost for? Uh, just can you just keep on going backward and I'll tell you which slide. Uh, okay. Please go back, back, back. Yes, this one. At this point, we lost you. At the next slide. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah please. Sorry about that. No, no, I mean, it's most probably our fault here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, Fender, because I could hear. So there's it's oh, maybe so an ICTS, ICTS yeah. problem. Yeah, sorry about this. Yes, very sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. there's this one extra mode that's, that you can still have even in the G goes to zero limit of quantum gravity. And that's this time shift between the left and right boundary. So if you start at t equals zero on the right boundary, you go straight through the black hole, you may not end up at what we're calling t, what's called t equals zero on the left boundary, right? The, the, the boundary times are physical degrees of freedom uh, because, because, you know, Diffeomorphisms are only, only gauged if they're small diffeomorphisms, not if they act non trivially at the boundary. So that's a physical degree of freedom between the left and right boundaries. And it's conjugate to the ADM masses on either side. Okay. Um, so the reason it's conjugate to both of them is that if we act with H on the right, 
minus h on the left, uh, then that doesn't actually change the time shift. It keeps the time shift constant. All it does is, is boost the quantum fields relative to the two boundaries. So it basically acts as a boost of the quantum fields without changing the, the time shift, the bulk quantum field. Okay, so the full Hilbert space is just the Q of T Hilbert space tensor, this extra degree of freedom and time shift. And I was saying we can conveniently choose a gauge where we take the right boundary time to be t equals zero uh, in the bulk. Okay, so we think of the right boundary as just being fixed, and we just allow fluctuations in the left boundary time. Okay, that's just a, a convenient gauge choice to be helpful, but we didn't need to make it. We could have could have worked in other ways. We get the same answer. Um, so we just have this wave function psi t in this L2 of R mode and describes the, the location of the left boundary t equals zero time relative to the sort of bulk time of the right boundary. Okay, so then we then wanted to define an algebra actually on this Hilbert space that is the algebra observables that someone outside the right black hole is able to see. It's generated by two things. First is just right exterior QFT observers, observables, and the second is the right ADM mass of the black hole. And I'm saying there's this minor subtlety where QFT observables really need to be dressed to a boundary to be gauge invariant. Um, but because we've chosen a gauge where the right boundary is sort of fixed at t equals zero, um, then QFT observables are automatically dressed to the right boundary if we don't do anything. Okay, but there, there, there's not much dressing needed because we're in a fixed background where we just have this one extra mode associated with the isometry, but uh, there's, there's nothing really else going on. Okay. There was another subtlety, which is that the right ADM mass actually becomes infinite as we take the limit, g goes to zero, which is what we want to do, uh, and keep the size of the black hole fixed. So we want to instead define a we normalized right ADM mass where we subtract off an infinite constant that's the sort of uh, just typical mass of the black hole in this background. This HR just describes small fluctuations of the ADM mass, finite small fluctuations of the ADM mass, but there's actually an infinite constant as well in the ADM mass that we've subtracted. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to people. Okay, so as we already discussed, uh, the algebra of QFT observables in some subregion, say the right exterior, uh, forms a type three von Neumann factor. Has no trace, has no rigorous notion of entropy. Of course, as physicists, all the time we define entropies for it, and that's fine. Um, so you could do that, uh, but if you do so, you don't get the Backinson Hawking entropy. So we're not going to do that. We're going to instead think about what happens when we add this right ADM. So this right ADM mass is equal to the left ADM mass plus, uh, as I said, a boost operator acting on the quantum fields. Okay, so the left ADM mass just changes the left boundary time. And we dressed all the quantum fields to the right boundary, chose a gauge where we did that. So that's all that this left ADM mass does. It doesn't actually change the state of the quantum field at all. And this boost operator H just does acts as a boost to the quantum fields and doesn't act at all on this L2 of R. Okay, so the right ADM mass is actually a combination of those things. It both boosts the quantum fields and changes this time shift mode. The asymmetry is just because of the way we chose the gauge. We could have chosen it differently. Uh, all the statements are independent gauge choice. It's just a way of basically a choice of how to decompose H into HQFT tensor L2. Different ways of doing that. Mathematically, it turns out this is something called a cross product. Um, in fact, H generates something called the modular flow of the hartle hawking state. Roughly what this means is that E to the minus H uh, is equal to the reduced density matrix. The morally, the reduced density matrix isn't really defined because it's a type 3 algebra, but we pretend it's defined. Reduced density matrix of the hartle hawking state on this side tends to the inverse of the reduced density matrix on this side. Okay. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a technical statement. Um, but it turns out to connect in a very interesting way to maths literature. So there's this very famous result. Uh, yeah. so, so if, if we start dressing the left region to the right, uh, wouldn't we oversaturate the degrees of freedom in the right boundary? Or is that a that a total statement? We're just do, we're, we're not doing we're not doing ADS safety here. Um, we can do what we can define a, a operator in the left exterior address to the right boundary. That's a Perfectly well-defined thing to do uh, in ADS CFT. 
it would be an operator that acts both on the left boundary and the right boundary. So it would be, be a two-sided operator, um, but we can still define it in ADS-CFT perfectly well. Um, yeah, it's, it's literally just, in this context, it's just left exterior operator address the left boundary conjugated by boost times the time shift. Um, boost times the time shift uh, takes you to from dress the left boundary to dress the right boundary. So it's a pretty trivial change. Thank you. Okay. So, um, yeah, so just to give you guys some history. Back in the day, von Neumann defined these type three von Neumann factors. He showed that they existed, um, but no one really knew what to do with them, what the point of them was. Everyone loved type two algebras. They had this beautiful mathematical structure in literature. And type three were just some ugly steps up as a child that no one liked. And then there's this famous result by Takasaki, where he basically showed how to relate uh, type three factors to type two factors. And he did so exactly by considering cross products by a modular flow, exactly the same mathematical setup that we found here in quantum gravity for a black hole. It turns out that when you, you take the cross product, of the particular type of type three factor um, that we have in quantum field theory by its modular flow, um, then we get a type two infinity factor. Okay, so that means it has a unique, well-defined trace. This trace in this case can be written explicitly as an integral over um, HL of exponential and HL times the expectation of your operator A in the hardo hawking state, the QFT field. Okay, so it's important here that A can depend explicitly on HL L, um, because A, the algebra includes HR, and HL is HR is equal to HL plus a QFT operator. Okay, so that's how this integral can converge. If A only acts on QFT fields, um, then this integral would diverge. It, it wouldn't give anything finite ever, um, which is good because. If A is only acting on the, the QFT fields, then it's in the type three algebra and, and operators in the type three algebra shouldn't have any sort of finite trace. Okay, but operators in the type two algebra where we can also have functions of HR can depend on, can have an expectation value that depends non-trivially on HL and that can cause this integral to convert. Okay. So it turns out, I'm not gonna explain the details of how this works. You can read, a uh, paper from last September by, by me, Ed Whitten, and uh, Ben Chandra Sekran, uh, for a very large class of so called what we call semi classical. Uh, Sorry, so there's something I missed in the previous formula. Yep. Uh, could you please go back one slide? Um, yep. Uh, yeah, so this so this trace, as you said, right, it looks like a thermal trace. So it would be what we'd call a thermal expectation yeah. value, except what sets the value of beta here? Why is beta set to the back? Uh, yeah, good. So, so uh, beta is actually determined by the relationship between the boost operator H and uh, the actual modular flow, right? So, so uh, really, the the density matrix on here isn't e to the minus H; it's e to the minus beta H. Okay, with beta the temperature of the black hole. Um, so that's, you that's what this, makes it. Okay. Do you get this from the algebra or do you get this by doing, I mean, usually to do, to get the temperature, as you said, you'd have to do some, you know, either go to the Euclidean theory you and you do get this from, Yeah, so, so this is determined by the algebra. Uh, it all comes out of the algebra, but what specifically it comes out of, of is the relationship between this operator that we called HR or HL, the ADM mass on the boundary and modular flow um, in the bulk. Okay, so, so there is a relationship between boosts in the bulk and modular flow, but it's a specific relationship where uh, the modular flow is essentially uh, beta times a boost. I see, okay. And beta here is the, the black hole temperature. So it comes out of the, the physics of QFT in the background. Ah, yeah, I see, I see. Sorry, sorry. So, so at some point you have to invoke the fact that you know, two point correlation functions have a certain form that's, yeah, that's exactly. determined by exactly. Yeah. Oh, I see. So you you yeah. if you put that in, then okay, then you can beat. I see. Like okay. the the it's just you know you have the KMS condition with with that particular. I see. I see. I see. Particular. So you have to you have to put that in somewhere. 
Yeah, I that's see. what that's what makes this thing be a cross product by a module flow, and it, it it sets the relationship between the two. I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So as I say, for for a large class of of nice so-called semi-classical states where we don't have big fluctuations in the time shift between the two sides, uh, then the entropy uh, defined for this type two infinity algebra that we obtained with this trace I showed on the previous slide is actually given exactly by the generalized entropy formula, expectation of A of 4G plus S volt. Okay, so um, there's a load of divergences we need to be careful about here. The first is that you have each of these terms separately is not well defined because of UV divergences, but their sum is well defined. Uh, and you know, the actual thing we get is, is the formula that is equivalent to the sum. It's equivalent to the, the finite sum, not, not the uh, um, not the individual pieces. Um, and the other thing is that because we're taking G goes to zero, then we also get a divergence from that as well. Okay, and that divergence is the infinite term that got subtracted uh, when defining the entropy of a type two algebra. Okay, so, so all the divergences get, get mapped together and we end up with a relationship between a finite type two algebra entropy and a finite finite fluctuations in generalized entropy uh, expectation of A and 4G plus X volt. The proof of this for, for general states is somewhat technical. Um, as I say, there's a, you, can, you can read our paper the, the details on how it works. Um, but there's a particular simple case that was actually discussed already by Witten um, it, from boundary perspective in, in paper he wrote last December, Gravity and the Cross Product. And that's just a state where uh, the bulk quantum fields are all in the Hardwell Hawking state. And then we just have some wave function for the time shift there. Okay, or equivalently, some wave function for the left ABM map. It's actually pretty easy to check that uh, just based on the formula of the trace on the previous slide, the reduced density matrix, the, the density matrix of, of this state on the right exterior algebra is given by uh, the modulus of this, this wave function squared, except now with the right ADM mass on the left one, that doesn't actually matter because uh, the harder Hawking state is boost invariance, the two are equal. Uh, and then we have an e to the minus B to HR at the front. Okay, so this is some operator in the right exterior algebra, and it, it turns out it's a density matrix. Trace of rho times any operator is equal to the expectation of that operator in this state. But it's also easy to just check by, by plugging in uh, that the entropy is the expectation of minus log rho, uh, that we get the entropy of the expectation of this thing, log of this thing, minus that is just expectation of beta hr, plus the expectation of minus log of this thing. So I believe that's actually a sign error. Um, there should be a minus sign there, I apologize. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah, we get a second term that, that comes from taking the log of this part away. Okay. The first law of black hole thermodynamics says that this first term is just equal to the expectation of the horizon area uh, minus so little hr is capital hr minus e naught and the first law of thermodynamics says that beta times that is equal to the expectation of a minus a naught where a naught is the the reference horizon area of the black hole the horizon area of a black hole of energy e naught okay so so that gives us this expectation of a over 4 g term also has this infinite a, a naught over 4 g term which is which is infinite gets subtracted and then the second term can be thought of as the, the bulk entropy of the area of fluctuation. So this is the, the sort of only part of S bulk. It's sort of a trivial part of S bulk, um, but it's the only part that depends on this wave function F of HR. Okay, so it's the only part that can appear for this particularly simple uh, state where the, the bulk fields are all in the heart of the state. I want to emphasize that this is not, this is far from the, the fact that this works is not the really interesting part. The really interesting part is that you consider some arbitrary semi-classical state with an arbitrary state of the bulk quantum fields, uh, then we still get the formula expectation of A over 4G plus S bulk, uh, where S bulk is now the entropy, the divergent QFT entropy of that state, which in general is different from that of the Hardo-Hawking state. 
Okay, that's the, the part that's really interesting, but its derivation is a lot more, more technical, so I'm not going to go through. Okay, so let me just very briefly talk about how we should think about this from boundary CFT's perspective, uh, and then I'm going to go on to other stuff like the situ and geogeo gravity. So bulk quantum fields are dual to single trace uh, boundary operators. Okay. Uh, so there's a very nice construction by, by Lighthouse and Liu from a bit over a year ago. But what you consider is just the large n limit of correlation functions of these single, single trace operators. And if you define, normalize things appropriately, then that large n limit is well defined. Then you can just take all that data and use it to construct a GNS Hilbert space. Uh, for the, the algebra of single trace boundary operators, just by, by plugging in those correlation functions and, and you know, plugging and chugging in the, the GNS construction. I'm not going to go through the details of this, but when you do so, you end up with a type three algebra generated by these single trace boundary operators. That type three algebra should be thought of as the type three uh, bulk QFT algebra that we described from the gravity side just now. In the microcanonical ensemble, so for states where there are finite fluctuations in energy in the large n limit, um, so these are dual to bulk to states that have finite fluctuations in the time shift, uh, then the operator uh, right CFT Hamiltonian minus E naught also has a well-defined large n limit. This operator corresponds in the bulk uh, to the, the renormalized right ADM in the obvious way, obvious ADS CFT dictionary. So together, this light has a new algebra and this renormalized uh, CFD Hamiltonian generate a uh, type two infinity factor in the large n limit. And that's exactly the one that we previously described from bulk quantum. I want to emphasize the fact that we worked in the microcanonical ensemble was important here. Uh, the canonical ensemble, which is in some ways the more usual, usual large n limit to take, uh, corresponds to states where the, the time shift between the two sides is perturbatively small. It's order one over n in size. So things like the thermal field double state has perturbatively small time shifts um, between the two boundaries in the large n limit. And this leads instead of the large n limit to a type three algebra with a large center. Um, but once you include perturbative corrections, then it becomes more like the microeconomical type two algebra that we just described. So this is sort of a technical detail from a book point of view. It's just about whether we have finite fluctuations of the time shift or not. So it's about how we take the semi-classical limit. But if you don't take that strict limit, then you know, there's, there's no question about how to do it and how things should scale in different ways anyway. Okay, so that's everything I'm gonna say about- Sorry, about just, just a question about, about the last thing. As you said, in the, yep. yeah, in the thermal field double state, I mean, we would still like a notion of the entropy of one side, right? Because at least in the large n limit, you would expect there is a notion of an entropy. So yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Uh, you can define one perturbatively. Um, the the reason it doesn't work as well is just because roughly the fluctuations in the entropy in the thermal field double state in the large n limit become infinite. They grow as order n. The fluctuations in the energy grow as order n, and so the fluctuations in the entropy also grow as order n. So if you want to define uh, entropies for every state that can be made from the thermal field double state, that includes, say, states where the, you project onto the thermal field double state having higher than average energy or onto it having lower than average en entropy. And the entropies you get in that way will differ uh, at sort of order n, and they will also differ at order 1. Um, and so if you want to define an entropy, it has to be in some sort of power series form. There's, there's not a natural, it's just not as clean a, a setup to define entropy. I see. The entropy uh, I think you're defining was uh, just trace of rho log rho for the, the reduced density matrix of one side, which would give you exactly A by 4G Newton plus, you know. Uh, so yeah, so finite that. n can do that. Uh, infinite n, the algebra is type 3, and so we can't define density matrices rho, density, uh, density matrix in the first place. And exactly the reason we can't do that is because the energy fluctuations become infinite in the canonical ensemble. And that corresponds to having infinite entropy fluctuations in the state. So so sorry, just, sorry. I, I, I just want to think about it from the CFT perspective. So I'm at large, but finite. Perspective, we still have infinite energy fluctuations. I, I understand so we, have, we have large energy fluctuations, but there's still a finite entropy. 
in between. A finite n, from this point of view, there's no difference between the canonical ensemble and the microcanonical ensemble. So the two only differ if you take the, the large n limit, because it's about whether the energy fluctuations are order n or the energy fluctuations are order 1. I understand, I understand. But what I was saying was, let's say we computed the entropy uh, in at, at finite n, and then we, we asked the question like s by n squared, which which has which is exactly the same both for the microcanonical and for the canonical ensemble. So yeah, good. Yeah. So in this rigorous way of doing things, there should be a way to understand that as well, right? I mean, yeah. So good. So the the order n squared term uh, is just a constant for every state in this large n Hilbert space, uh, and so there's sort of nothing to say about it. So that's why we don't we don't say in, in, have interesting to say about it. In, either case, um, but for the canonical ensemble Hilbert space, you have order n fluctuations in entropy order. So there are different states in the same large n Hilbert space, the different entropy by order n. And you can make sense of that. We have an appendix where we, we try to make sense of that. It's less clean than the microcanonical version because it it's all involves power series in n, um, but you can do so. I see. Uh, we also have various ideas about how to define a large n algebra that doesn't require uh, picking a, a particular temperature or a particular entropy. And so you can also talk about the n squared term and say interesting things about that. That's that's ongoing work. Uh, Edward and I have been thinking about a bit, but it's still a large way from long way from completion to. to I see. The so the, the, the just going to the order one term after you divide by n squared. I mean, it's a constant, but it depends on the temperature. It's some temperature dependent constant. So that, that there's still an interesting piece there. So yes, I, I agree it is interesting. What I'm saying is that uh, it's sort of a constant of the algebra, right? To define these algebras, we had to pick a size for the black hole, we had to pick a temperature. It would be very nice to not have to do that. We have ideas about how to, to generalize the construction so you don't have to do that. Um, we have not completed those ideas yet. That is ongoing okay. work. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a bit about the sitter space. I'm just gonna say something very briefly. This was a paper in uh, June, I believe, with with Witten, Chandrasekhar, and Longo. Uh, so we can basically do the same thing, same construction for, for an observer in a causal patch in the sitter space. So we'll stick the observer here at the sort of south pole of the sitter sphere, and then they can see see this causal diamond like this. So the observer can measure quantum fields in a small neighborhood of their world line. And just like I, I said um, for black holes, I said that the operators of infinity were enough to learn everything in the entire causal patch. There's a nice theorem that says that these operators uh, generate the entire type three QFT algebra of quantum fields in this causal patch. Okay, so, uh, we were just doing quantum field theory in the sitter space, then the observables associated with this world line would be a type three uh, von Neumann factor. But again, uh, quantum gravity gives us something that we wouldn't have if we were literally doing QFT in a fixed curve space time. It's a bit different this time. Though. Unlike for a black hole, we don't have any asymptotic boundaries. And so we have no extra sort of physical degree of freedom uh, describing, describing their time shift. But we still do have something that wouldn't be there if we were just doing QFT. And in this case, the sitter space has some isometries. And because we're doing quantum gravity, those isometries should be treated as gauge constraints. They shouldn't be treated as physical symmetries in the system. They're just a change of coordinates uh, and coordinates uh, on physical and quantum gravity. Of course, the fact that we know this observer's world line is in a particular place of the south pole of the sphere breaks some of these isometries, it breaks them down to the isometry of the static patch. And those isometries just consist of rotations of the static patch together with, with time translations of the static patch or, or boosts, equivalently boosts of global space. So the physical algebra, if this is some, some gauge constraint, should be the gauge invariant subalgebra of this type three QFT algebra associated with this static patch. For rotations, this is a perfectly sensible notion. We can restrict the gauge invariant parts. It just consists of the, the sort of S mode operators, rotationally invariant operators, operators that don't, don't have any spin. 
However, it turns out the only operators that are invariant on a boost, only operators localized within the static packs are invariant on a boost, invariant on time translations are multiple to the other end. So just see them. So just to see a naive way of why this is true, let's say we had some operator here that was at some particular time. We could try to define some, some time invariant version of A by sort of integrating A over all time translations of A, so integrated along this entire world line from minus infinity to infinity. But up in this top corner here and down in this bottom corner here, any state just looks like a thermal state. Okay, states in the static patch thermalize. So there's some infinite range of times where A just looks like, as far as A knows, it's just in the vacuum state. So it ends up, once you do this integral, you define it in a way to get some, some finite sensible operator A, then that operator is actually just the thermal, thermal expectation value of A times the identity. It's just equal, equal acts as the identity on, on any quantum state. So this is sort of a version and this restricted context of semi-classical quantum gravity in the sitter space of the standard statement that there are no local observables in quantum gravity because they always have to be dressed to make them in some way different. Of course, uh, physically, the idea that we can't measure anything because to do so, we'd have to average over, over all times from minus infinity to infinity to get something gauge invariant, or because we have to dress something all the way to infinity to, to be able to measure something, is completely an utter nonsense. It's, it's totally unphysical. I don't know about you guys, uh, but I live in a universe that is quantum mechanical and has gravity, and I measure things every day, and I don't have to do so by by going off to asymptotic infinity or averaging over an infinite range of time. Okay, so how do I do that? Um, well, I do it by, by carrying a clock with it, with me. Okay, in practice, I like know the time at any given point in time, so I've looked at my, my phone every once in a while, um, but even if I didn't have a phone, I would have my brain, and my brain can distinguish different times. It's in a different state at different times, and so it does measurements at a time uh, signaled by its its fixed brain clock time, not by some some arbitrary choice of background coordinate time. Okay, so this is the idea of relational observables, the idea that even in quantum gravity, we can define uh, meaningful observables relative to to uh, our own our own observers world line. Of course, this is a famously difficult idea to make sense of in in full generality. We're in a very restricted context here, so, so we'll turn out that we can actually do so in a very satisfactory way. So what we're going to do is we're going to take into account that the world observer going along their world line is going to carry some clock, and so they're going to know what time it is. The stupidest model would just be to give them some classical clock, to have them there each point in that world line be labeled by some classical time t that increases along the world line, and then sort of all, all QFT operators could be defined just, just by relation to, to time on the world line, would just break the boost symmetry of the system at a classical, classical geometrical level, and we just get back the original type 3 QFT out. That's better than we had, because at least now we get the physically realistic thing that the observer can measure quantum field th fields around them. Um, but it's like slightly sad because we wanted a notion of entry. But there's a better model of a clock. And that's to remember. So the observer, whoever they are, is a quantum mechanical degree of freedom, which means any clock they're using uh, should be a quantum mechanical clock. Okay, we want this clock to be able to, to tell uh, long ranges of time, to distinguish between long range of times, not have sort of Poincare recurrences, things like that. Um, so we'd like to have, at least in the, the semi-classical limit, this clock to have a continuous spectrum. Okay. On physical grounds, the spectrum should also be bounded from below because we shouldn't be able to have arbitrarily large localized negative energy. So we're going to have the Hilbert space of the clock just be L2 of R plus, L2 of the positive real nines, with the, the energy of the clock just given by this, this quantity x that is greater than or equal to zero. It's the simplest, stupidest model of a clock that can tell arbitrarily, lo arbitrarily long times and is physically reasonable um, that you could possibly have. It's going to turn out to give a very satisfactory answer. Okay, so for the moment, let's forget about the fact that the clock is going to have positive energy, and let's just consider the case where it can have any energy from minus infinity to infinity. 
Before imposing the gauge constraints, the observer's algebra would now be the type three GFT algebra tensored with any operator they want in the clock. Okay, because the clock's right there, they can, can make anything you want about it. But we now want to restrict to operators that are boost invariant. What does boost invariant mean now mean? Well, now we've got to boost both the QFT fields, so there's some operator H, like the black hole that generates boost in the quantum field theory fields, and there's also this operator X that generates time translations of the clock. Okay, a boost does both of those things. So we want to find operators that commute with H black X. Happily, this time we do have some, some non-trivial gauge invariant operators. Our algebra doesn't just end up being multiples of the identity. So there's a couple of obvious ones, which are firstly just the energy X of the clock that right, commutes with X and it also commutes with H because H doesn't act in the clock at all. There's another one, which is to take some QFT operator, arbitrary QFT operator A, and then conjugate it by e to the minus IPH, where H is the boost operator acting on quantum fields, and P is the conjugate variable, the energy of the clock. Roughly, you should think of this as taking the operator A, but saying rather than measuring it, saying we're measuring something at coordinate time t, we're now measuring something at boost, uh, clock time t. Okay, so p should be thought of as the clock time the clock shows at coordinate time equals zero, and so this conjugate operator is shifting, uh, boosting the the quantum fields by amount equal to the difference between the coordinate clock and the Sorry, the coordinate time and the clock times. It turns out, in fact, that these two operators are everything you have. These generate the entire gauge invariant algebra. There's some very non trivial maths involved in showing that, something called Takasaki duality, but it works out. We can think of this as an algebra generated by X and this thing. It's also convenient to conjugate the entire algebra by e to the IPH. Um, just an isomorphism in the algebra. The structure of the algebra is not going to change. And when we do that, it's instead conjugated, or generated by arbitrary little a and big A. So it's generated by the entire QFT algebra A, just because we removed the conjugation by minus IPH here. And then we also have uh, X conjugated by E to the IPH. That's just equal to X minus H. Equivalently, it's equal. Uh, so, so it's generated by A together with X minus H. But equivalently, it's generated by A minus X plus H. Okay. May seem weird, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So so there's this there's this issue that you you want to you want to get rid of, which is the issue of the constraint, and which is why you introduce the clock. But of course, when you do that, yeah. you know, the, the accuracy, I mean, you can't have a clock which has arbitrarily low energy but has arbitrarily high accuracy. So that you you'd have to deal with oh, issues. Yeah, yeah. Like so if you have a relational observer, you need, you need some classical background. So I mean, is it important here that the clock has to have some mass, which will have some back reaction and will affect things? So is that something that we we don't want? To yeah, great. So we're taking the semi-classical limit. Um, so the back reaction of the clock is very small, it's perturbatively small. Uh, also, when we say the clock has continuous spectrum, uh, we mean that in the semi-classical limit, it has continuous spectrum. So really, it means that it it's sort of the, the gaps between the energy the, and the time the clock lasts for uh, is parametrically longer than the de Sitter time. That's like really easy to achieve, right? That happens all the time for any reasonable size quantum system. You have a very dense spectrum whose density is parametrically larger than the, the de Sitter time scale. Um, so this is some, some semi-classical idealization of something, uh, but it's a semi-classical idealization that you can like easily approach. Uh, I see. And, and, so the idea yeah. is the clock is much heavier than the cosmological scale. It's much lighter than the Planck scale, and so it has accuracy, yeah, exactly. which is yeah. which is much larger than. I mean, it, it can't achieve Planck time accuracy, exactly. but it can achieve some order one accuracy, yeah. and that that's that's how one should think of it. Yeah. So probably we should really think of the energy of the clock as not being bounded from below by zero, but being bounded from below by something much larger than one, right? So the x is the energy in cosmological units. Um, so the continuous spectrum just means the gap between energy states is small in cosmological units. That's very, very achievable. Uh, but if you want to have some localized observer and some localized clock, they're actually going to be a lot heavier. Uh, all the states are going to be a lot, lot, lot heavy compared to top cosmological scales. So actually you but, want to be, think of X as being bounded from low by some large thing. No, that's fine. Actually, that's, 
also much lighter than the Planck scale, right? So everything here is much, much, is smaller. much lighter than the Planck scale. Exactly. These are not black holes. These are, yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the reason I wrote minus X plus H rather than X minus H uh, is that if we identify X with minus HL in this formula, then this looks like exactly the same construction we had for black holes. We have some type three QFT algebra. We have some uh, operator on an L2 of R. Remember, we forgot about X being greater than or equal to zero, plus a boost operator. And we're considering the algebra generated by the two of them. Okay. And so we get exactly uh, the, same, the same algebra we had before. It seems like we again have a type two infinity algebra. Except I have, I have we question. forgot. Yep. So how do, how do you understand this clock works just like the actual time in the space time? Like, does this, is this clock deform of invariant by itself or? Uh... Uh, the clock is a physical degree of freedom. So it just shows some time. It's some, so there's some quantum mechanical degree of freedom, L2, L2 of R. And, you know, the position of that L2 of R tells you that the time the clock is set, same. Um, and then we're just defining, uh, you know, so, so, Time translations, time translations, which are, are just gauge transformations, act on both the time shown by the clock and on the quantum fields in the with the city background. Um, and then you can define gauge invariant operators that basically look something like when my clock shows t equals zero, I'm gonna measure some quantum field. It's a quantum uh, version of that. Like, would, would the clock feel the gravitational background like would if there's a black hole or something would the clock dilate or not uh yes yeah, so the clock is just going along the observer's world line the observer's world line is fixed and so we don't have to worry about any of that but in principle sure it would um so how is that incorporated like isn't it uh, as far as i can see isn't it put in as a completely independent degree of freedom because in the, in yeah, the, the ADS is ADS in the it's because it's in sitting on the word observer's world line. We fixed it to sit on the observer. The observer is carrying the clock. The observer is not jumping into any black holes or anything. There are no black holes. This is a sit of background, but in particular, the observer is just going along some world line in the middle, and we're not. We could have added in degrees of freedom where the observer can move around or something like that. We just we didn't choose choose to include that in our model. So the observer is just sitting at the south pole of the sitter. It's not doing any, anything. They're not doing anything. They're just carrying some clock. And maybe at some time they look at their clock, see what time it says, and uh, do measurements based on that. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah, just to say, Jeff, it's not really that there are no black holes. There is no Planck scale energy anywhere. I mean, you can have Planck scale energy yeah. in my hand without having black holes. So it's yeah, there, there can't be any black black holes. No, the, no, yeah, any any the excitations here are excitations of quantum fields. The excitations of the clock potentially, and also quantum fields with wavelength. That is finite in cosmological units. Right. We're right. taking the Planck scale to zero in cosmological yeah. units. Okay. Yeah, that's an important point. There were no, definitely no black holes. Okay. So because we have this constraint that the, the energy of the clock should be bounded from below, then the real actual algebra is the projection of this type two infinity algebra we have for black holes onto having uh, x greater than or equal to zero, onto having this, this clock energy being positive. So recall that for black holes, the trace uh, was given by, was the integral of uh, HL times e to the beta HL, but we've now identified X with minus HL. So it's now the integral dx of e to the minus beta X times the expectation of A, and this is now the de Sitter vacuum, the, the de Sitter invariant state. But if X has to be greater than or equal to zero, if we project it onto that, then this trace will be finite for any bounded operator. So for any bounded operator, this thing uh, will be some bounded function of x. And the integral of that times e to the minus beta x from zero to infinity uh, is always bounded. So the algebra is no longer type 2 infinity. Instead, it turns out to be a type 2 1 factor. Okay, it's that very first construction we saw is that with an infinite set of, of maximally entangled qubits. In a type 2 1 algebra, you have a maximally mixed state. You have a maximally entangled state. It just corresponds to having the density matrix rho equal to the identity. Okay. But that state just 
is the state that we get where the expectation value of A is just always given by its trace. What does that look like? It looks like uh, the quantum fields are in this empty de Sitter state, the, the de Sitter invariant vacuum, and the observer's clock is in a thermal state with a temperature equal to the de Sitter temperature. So this is exactly the sort of you know, empty de Sitter and apparently in thermal equilibrium, except what we're finding is that that actually corresponds to a, a maximally mixed, maximally entangled state, not a thermal state at all. So this explains an old observation that was made that any time you try to perturb de Sitter space, whatever you do, you always end up decreasing the generalized entropy. You can try to say, uh, add extra entropy of bulk fields inside the static patch and increase the generalized entropy that way, in doing so, you'll always reduce the area of the cosmological horizon. You reduce the area by more than you increase the entropy, so the generalized entropy will decrease. Conversely, you could try to put some negative energy in the static patch to make the area of the horizon bigger, um, area of the de Sitter horizon bigger. You can do that. You can make it bigger. But if you do so, then you have to disentangle the de Sitter vacuum, uh, like disentangling Windler modes, and that reduces the bulk entropy of the static patch, and you end up decreasing the generalized entropy again. So whatever you do, you end up decreasing the generalized entropy. And that's because actually secretly, uh, just the de Sitter vacuum, this thing that seemed thermal, uh, was maximally mixed all along. OK. So, wait, there's something I didn't understand here, uh, which is that if you if you just took a type 3 algebra and a QFT, and you, and you said, I'll, I'll postulate there's an observer and a clock in addition, you shouldn't yeah, be able yeah, yeah. to convert it to a type two infinity algebra, right? So what is different here? Uh, yeah, it's like you, you you need some quantum gravity to get this sort of gauge invariance. Uh, if you just added an observer and a clock to a QFT, you, your Hilbert space would just be H QFT and the clock, uh, and your algebra would just be the algebra operators acting on the clock and some algebra of QFT things, and they commute with each other. And it wouldn't add anything new. You just get a type three algebra a tensor, some type one algebra the clock or whatever, and it would. Oh, I see. But if you if you look at the set of uh, set of operators that address to the clock, in the sense that you know they're not exactly. defined by the eight time, but they're defined with respect to clock time, you're saying that would be type two infinity even in a QFT. Uh, yes. Yes. So then, then we always if have we type two infinity them, algebra, yes. right? Rest them based on boost time. So what were you saying? Then don't we always have type two? I mean, then, then because we always are, are making reference to some clock in the system. So why should we? I mean, then you say we never really should speak of type three. Yeah. I I mean, we, we only are in the sense that secretly we always have quantum gravity. Um, no, no, secretly we have a clock that we we make reference to, which is I mean, that isn't a you know if you make. But, but, but it's just also I, I mean, if you're doing quantum mechanics, time is some classical degree of freedom. I, you don't I, need it. Right. If, 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 you're, if you're gauging time translations and saying the only physical observables have to be based on a clock time and not based on a, a ordinary time, then, then um, yeah, then I, I think you're doing quantum gravity, aren't you? Um, well, I mean, this is an interesting problem anything. people ask in quantum mechanics as well, right? I mean, uh, which is how, how you measure time. I mean, you're right. You just take time to be a parameter and not something. But you could ask if if you don't take time to be a parameter, but you you have some physical yeah. clock that gives you time. So you then say that you know yeah, I you could do in QFT. So it's always type two infinity in some sense if you do that. I I want to dispute that, but I would have to think harder to do so. So I'm not going to constantly okay. confidently dispute that now. I think the difference is sort of a you could use other clocks. In a more meaningful sense, I, I mean, it just depends how you model the observer, I guess. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's also quite important here that you have a connection between time and and some modular flow, right? So you need some sort of killing horizon or something like that. Um, okay. I, I if you just have a causal diamond, you don't have any killing symmetry, and I'm not sure how you you make sense of it. Makes okay. it makes sense of any construction. Okay. Okay. So finally, let me just talk a bit about the the most recent paper. As I say, I want to talk about this in a lot more detail, but um, let me just say some some high words, high level words. Uh, so there's one disadvantage of the constructions that I've described so far, um, which is that to define these sort of semi-classical algebras, we had to first 
fix the geometry, fix the, say, some, some temperature of a black hole, or fix to be small perturbations about the sitter space, so on. Okay. Of course, if we don't fix the geometry at all and just try to do, say, four dimensional quantum gravity without taking g to zero, um, then we're going to fail disastrously. We're not going to be able to define anything at all. Um, but there's a nice intermediate ground uh, where we can have fluctuations in the space time geometry, um, but things are still a lot more under control. And that's JT gravity plus matter. Okay, so it's a two dimensional theory of quantum gravity. And uh, there's different things people mean by semi-classical limit in JT gravity. Normally, what they mean is, is a so-called high temperature limit. So if you go to very high temperature, then the, the Schwarzian mode becomes weakly coupled, and the, the corrections to the beckinson hawking entropy become small, and so on. Um, we're not going to take that. We're going to work at finite temperature. Uh, so there's large quantum corrections. The, the boundary particle has, has so-called large fluctuations. Uh, but we're not going to include everything you can include in JT gravity. In particular, we're not going to include any wormholes. Okay, so the fact that we're not including wormholes roughly corresponds to having infinite S naught, uh, infinite. Uh, this S naught you can think of as just the parameter in front of the the Hilbert Einstein Hilbert action in two dimensions. It's it's what it's a Gauss Bonnet term that suppresses suppresses higher topologies, um, but physically it's Sort of the extremal entanglement entropy of the black hole, it's the entanglement entropy of the zero temperature black hole. So if this is infinite, we expect the algebra to be type two, not type one. If we really are just keeping everything finite, then we'd the Bakhtin Hawking entropy should be finite, and we should have somehow have a type one algebra. That's probably going to be really hard to get. Um, but even when S naught is infinite, you still have these highly fluctuating boundary particles, and that means you can have things like very long wormholes supported by shocks. Uh, you can have, you know, weird excitations of matter that create all sorts of interesting stuff. So here's some example. You can have a load of matter sitting in the middle. Doesn't have to be any sort of limit or anything like that. It's just some stuff sitting there. And uh, that creates a much longer wormhole with a large gap. So this is, this is showing one boundary, physical boundary trajectory. This is showing the other one. And there's sort of a large gap between them. If you didn't have the matter, uh, then a light ray from one boundary would almost touch the other boundary with, with matter, then you have a long wormhole and so this doesn't matter. Okay, so we'd like to define an algebra of observables uh, for, say, the right exterior uh, for this theory. Um, but because the location of the boundary itself is fluctuating from a, from a fixed bulk background perspective, uh, then there's not some sort of fixed bulk region that can be reconstructed from, from specifically the right boundary or from specifically the left boundary or from neither boundary. If we so create matter excitations that back reacts on the boundary, it changes and so on. And so what's visible changes. So there's not the same thing where we can just start with some bulk QFT algebra and then maybe add in some boundary degrees of freedom and, and get some get some algebra visible from the from the boundary. But we can still define an algebra associated to the right boundary and one associated to the left boundary. It's just generated by bulk operators just sitting at this right boundary, appropriately would normalize, OK? At some fixed boundary time, some boundary time t equals 0, boundary time t equals t, you can just measure some bulk matter operator at wherever the boundary is at that time. And then, of course, we also have the boundary Hamiltonian, boundary ADM mass. And those two things together generate some algebra. Turns out, at least we get strong evidence. It's harder to prove because there's not a, a huge maths literature studying these things. It's not a cross product by mod modular flow anymore. Um, and it's proving things about von Neumann algebras is very annoying and technical. Um, but it's definitely a type 2 infinity algebra um, because we can define a trace. And we're pretty confident it's a factor because it's hard to imagine anything that could be in the center. Uh, so we again get a type 2 infinity factor. If it's a type 2 infinity factor, then there should be a unique trace. And indeed, that trace is given by essentially the infinite temperature limit of the so-called JT gravity uh, hartle hawking state. This is where the bulk, bulk matter fields are just in their vacuum state, and the boundary particles are given by some particular wave function um, that describes the, uh, the hartle hawking state. If we plug in 
this trace, use it to define density matrices and so on, then we get entropies that exactly agree with the answers you get using Euclidean gravity, Euclidean replica trick uh, computations. But we're getting them as the entropies of reduced density matrices on such the algebra, rather than as some abstract black magic gravity stuff that by the magic of ADS CFT is dual to an actual CFT entropy computation. Okay, so we're really computing an actual entropy concretely in canonically quantized gravity. I want to emphasize how important it was here that we had matter. In JT gravity without matter, then the boundary algebra only consists of the boundary Hamiltonian. So you just have the right boundary Hamiltonian and functions of it in the right boundary, and functions of the left boundary Hamiltonian and the left boundary. And these two things are actually equal to one another if you have matter. So the two algebras are actually both commutative and they're actually the same algebra. And as a result, uh, any linear functional in that algebra will be tracial. It will satisfy the property of trace AB equals trace BA just because AB equals BA is operators because the algebra is commutative. This means there's no, definitely no unique trace. There's a complete total ambiguity in what the trace is. It means there's also essentially a complete total ambiguity in what entropies are. JT gravity without matter from a canonically quantized perspective does not know um, about the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. It does not know anything about, about the entanglement really at all. Euclidean path integral calculations still do, um, but the canonically quantized theory doesn't. When you add matter, then the canonically quantized theory knows just as much as the, the Euclidean gravity path integral does. Except it doesn't know about one. But um, you can try to add that in, and there's, there's some things we say in the paper that we talk about. OK, so it is quite late here, um, which is good, because uh, I'm on my final slide. So let me just say, you know, what do we take away from all this? What's the, the lesson of all these stories? I think the real thing is that Lorentzian semi-classical gravity uh, knows more about the bekenstein hawking entropy than just that it's some classical thermodynamic entropy. It really does know that it's a statistical entropy. It knows that it's in some way counting something. It's counting some number of degrees of freedom. It's, of course, an infinite number of degrees of freedom because we've taken g to zero, but it knows as much as it could possibly reasonably expect to know. You just have to throw a bit of fancy maths at it for a while to get it to spit all that out. But if you push it hard enough, then it really will do so. It, it knows everything you could use to know. We also learned that even though uh, quantum fields in, in the De Sitter vacuum seem like they're in a finite temperature thermal state on the static patch, there's actually a deeper sense in which the full state on the static patch is maximally mixed. And that's why it has maximal entropy. If it wasn't maximally mixed, it couldn't have maximal entropy because you just project onto the, the smaller eigenvalues of the density matrix and you make a state with bigger entropy. Turbid gravity turns out is enough to get you from a type three algebra to a type two algebra. Of course, non-perturbatively, black hole entropy is finite. So we should really be looking eventually to get type one algebras, type one factors that are describing the stuff outside the black hole. Seems like from everything we learned in the last few years, the wormholes are some part of that story. They don't seem to be all of it. They still you know, only give vaguely coarse-grained answers that are consistent with an entire ensemble of theories rather than just picking out a single unique theory. Um, but there's got to be more going on than that. Uh, in ADS CFT, the CFT is the answer that has a type one algebra at finite n. That's just the algebra of all CFT observables on the right CFT. Um, but it'd be nice, you know, <laughs> I say it would be nice. It's the dream to understand that from both point of view. But even at this type two stage, there's still a lot of really interesting physics that you can understand and really interesting stuff going on. There's a huge amount of things that I didn't talk about today that, that we've done in these papers and have done in future papers. Uh, you can understand, at least in some simple examples, uh, the generalized second law is this very simple statement about uh, monotonicities of entropies where you trace out over some degrees of freedom. Um, you can understand scrambling physics in this language uh, using what's called free product von Neumann algebras. And there's a whole interesting set of observations there. There's, there's new things we, that seem to show up about, about how the QES prescription works and how non perturbative corrections to it work from, from non minimal QSs that nobody had seen before from the Euclidean gravity side. And we now need to try and go and understand. Um, 
there's this whole story about supersymmetric zero energy wormholes that, that Juan and people uh, started talking about last summer. You can use these sort of tools to, to make very precise concrete statements about them. You can, you can find exactly what the, the states that exist. Uh, supersymmetric zero energy wormholes with matter, you can, you can exactly find what states exist and so on. Uh, it roughly matches what, what Juan and Co thought. Juan is a pretty smart guy. He, he's normally right, um, but we can, we can really like see what the states are. Uh, so that's that's still to come out um, at some point, hopefully soon. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of really exciting progress that can be made using these tools. Uh, I think that that's something that's been underutilized in physics. Uh, and I think yeah, I encourage people to to play around with them and see what you can work out. I'm sure there's a lot of interesting things that we haven't we haven't seen yet. Um, so yeah, that's that's I guess all I have to say. Uh, any questions? Um. Hey, I have a question. Th th thank you for the talk. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, sure. Yeah, please. Okay. So you, you said uh, in the non perturbative case, it, uh, one would like to understand from the bulk why there's a type 1 algebra, but why isn't it clear if you just assume that the bulk uh, has a unique vacuum? Then the ADM Hamiltonian has a projector in the vacuum, and so there's a type 1 algebra. Yeah, it, it's clear that. Um, sorry. It's clear that it's type one if it exists. Um, what, what's not clear is how to make sense of canonically quantized non-perturbative quantum gravity um, and like like actually understand what are the say stuff. Uh, I see. Yeah, like the type okay. two algebra, we actually, we understand what it is. Um, I see. That's so if, I mean. you, if you assume that there is some notion of an asymptotic algebra and the ADM Hamiltonian makes sense, then it's clear there's type one. But what you want to ask is something yeah. more than that. Yeah, yeah, I, okay. I'd like to. I'd like to be be confident as well defined. I'd like to understand non-perturbative quantum gravity is, is what I'm trying to say here. I'm I'm, okay. I'm I'm just saying the thing we'd all like to do and none of us can be. Uh, okay. okay, I have a question. It's very uh, yep. interesting talk, <laughs> very provocative. Uh, you know, is it possible for these type of uh, methods to throw some light on, for example, the question of the black hole singularity or the initial singularity in cosmology? I mean, you know, these are fundamental questions, uh, which uh, we usually evoke string theory for. Uh, you have some thoughts on that? I, I, yeah, I don't have, I don't have an obvious suggestion about how it would. Um, so, uh, Lighthouse and you have, have, you know, they're, they're really interested in the fact that this large end structure uh, gives you a natural operator that does sort of null translations um, in the black hole. And if you translate with that far enough, uh, then it sort of theoretically should take you to the singularity. Um, but my understanding, and I, I should check on this, is that in some way, there's some weird calculation where it doesn't end up seeing the singularity, like it, it becomes non-sensitive to what's going on at the same time as it reaches the singularity. Uh, but I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if this is based on public published work or not. This is something I've been been told and do not understand in detail. Um, so I think so far, you know, these sort of algebraic methods have not said anything terribly concrete about the singularity. One thing, one thing that's true, I think, is that having this sort of large N this, this sort of type two or three algebraic structure is pretty crucial um, for getting a sharp horizon, uh, for getting you know just a sharp classical geometry in, in any way, but in particular a sharp horizon. Um, and so that tells you that that's related to taking the strict large n limit in a pretty pretty precise way. Um, but we sort of knew that. Uh, it maybe tells you something about exactly why it fails if you go away from large n why you know why why uh, the horizon is like less well defined um yeah the singularity seems hard i've never seen anything that really seemed like it was going to give insight in the singularity um in, that anyone has done to be honest uh, thank you thank you very much are there any questions? Uh, Rader, she has, has raised his hand. Uh, 
Pradeshi, you have a question? Or, or maybe it's accidental. In this case, um, I mean, could you say explicitly what is actually the relation between these two kind of ways of thinking? So what are the two kind of ways of thinking? Uh, in terms of the wormholes in, you know, in path integrals and uh, on one hand and the John Neumann algebra kind of consideration on the other hand. What is the relation? Yeah, uh, the, the von Neumann algebra story, as we understand it very concretely today, uh, then it's all about semi-classical limits where wormholes are infinitely suppressed, so you don't they they, they don't show up at all. Um, perturbative corrections from wormholes don't seem like they change that very much. Uh, Non-perturbative corrections from wormholes should change it a lot. They should completely change it. They should change the structure of the algebra totally so that it becomes type one in some way. Uh, but I think we we really don't know how to make sense of, of that physics. So, so wormholes are understanding more sophisticated physics at a less sophisticated level. Uh, the von Neumann algebra stuff is understanding the sort of perturbative physics that we we kind of think we know pretty well, but like really understanding it correctly. I think uh, I think that's that's what you should say about it. That it's okay. The thanks. right way to think about the relationship between semi-classical gravity and entropy. Uh, if there are no more questions, we can end the talk. So uh, thank uh, job for the nice talk. Thanks. Yeah.